Bom dia pessoal, tudo bem? É, hoje mais uma vez a live em inglês, o entrevistado de hoje é o Kevin Stolt, então eu vou rapidamente mudar é, para o inglês. Lembrando que amanhã nós temos a entrevista com o Marcelo Tosi à noite, na quinta-feira, cheio quatro da tarde, a gente tem o Olivier, Olivier Filipe Hertz, sexta-feira Priscila Azevedo e por enquanto é isso. Okay. Hey everyone, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Today we will interview uh, Kevin Stolt. He's already on. I will be asking him to join us really soon. Uh, just reminding you all that tomorrow night we have the, one, the event writer uh, Marcelo Tosi. On Thursday I will interview Olivier Filipe Aert and on Friday the vet Priscilla Zeville, which should be really nice. Um, well, I got the questions ready. Uh, the interview usually lasts around one to an hour and a half, so wait until I give you the tip so you can start sending the questions. Otherwise, I might not be able to read them uh, through the interview, okay? I will ask Kevin to join us, and hopefully it's going to be a good one. See you guys soon. Something went wrong, Kevin is missing. Let me send him a message. I think he, he joined in and I was speaking Portuguese. He gave up, so Kevin stood and yeah. I uh, will wait just a little longer. No, no, no Kevin here. Uh, well, what else? We'll just wait a little bit until Kevin is, is joining in again. Joining in again. Uh, it might not take too long. Let's start the live. Live. Join us. Okay. Um. For you guys that don't actually know me, I am a Brazilian photographer. I'm pretty sure that everyone that's in here now knows it. But we'll see how it goes in a while. For some reason, Kevin is not showing on my invitation list. So I'm not sure what's going on. Hopefully it will work soon enough. Uh, what else? As you all know, well, we might have an interview on Saturday. I'm thinking of a new project that will probably go on on Saturday. It's, I will probably tell you guys a little bit later about that. But I might get an interview on Saturday as well, so please keep your schedule free. I'm waiting for the confirmation. It's gonna be huge and amazing if he says yes. Um, but I'm having to work around there on problems with well, time zone, timelines, shows, and etc. It's, it, gets, it, it will get trickier as we go on because we are, thank God, almost off quarantine. So because of that, I might have to work around. Um... Oh, there you go. Good. I'm trying to, Kevin, you're not. I'm trying to. Let's see if I can. If it's not working, I might uh, shut this live down and turn it on again. Uh, we'll see, Kevin Stoat. All right. Hopefully, it's good now. There you go. There we go. Hi. Hey, how are you? 
Really good on you. Very, very good. First of all, thank you very much for um, accepting the invitation. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm really happy to do it as well. Very good. Kevin, where are you right now? I'm uh, in Normandy. It's uh, northwest of France. Um, I'm in, uh, in my stables. And uh, yeah, right now we have uh, no shows, no competitions. So uh, I spend my uh, all days here. And, uh, but it's nice. Normally at this, uh, at this time, we, we don't have so uh, much nice weather. But uh, right now it's really sunny. We are enjoying. Horses are happy. So could be worse. <laughs> okay. I will wait. I will take the question about what you're doing for a little bit later on. But, uh, well, the first question, and I believe every story has got a beginning, is uh, how, when, and why did you start riding and walking with horses? I started riding uh, quite late. Uh, I was uh, 12 years old. Uh, I'm not from a uh, horse family. So, but I was used to, to come in, uh, in Normandy, uh, the place uh, where I'm based right now. And, um, you know, when you come in Normandy, the first thing you see, it's uh, cows and horses in the field. And um, I love the animals since, um, since the beginning. Um, not especially the horses, but every kind of animals. And, um, and then, yeah, like it was so many horses in Normandy all around. Um, I asked my mom if I could start somewhere and I went to riding school. And yeah, that's it. So um, I was 12. It's quite late. Um, I'm, um, I think in France, uh, the first generation of riders uh, who could have a career without coming from a horse family. And um, yeah, I don't say that it's easier or more difficult. It was like this. And you had the, the generation, the past generation, like... Um, Bosti or uh, Philippe Rosier, Patrice de Laveau, um, who had, um, you know, in backstage, uh, the stables from the parents, uh, riding school, and for sure they were uh, starting to ride at uh, three or four years old, even before walking, I think. So, I mean, it was completely different. I, I studied really quite late. Did you start with ponies or you went straight to the uh, horses? No, straight to the horses because uh, I was uh, tall already and uh, the ponies were too small for me. All right. Um, and then, okay, you start riding in the pony school, in the horse school, but when did you start competing and taking a little bit more serious? I started competing, um, I think, two years later, so around 14. And um, for sure, uh, um, I loved riding, but most of all spending time with horses, you know, before, after riding, uh, to brush them and uh, um, to stay in the stables, the smell, the, yeah, the atmosphere, it was really what I enjoyed at the beginning. And, um, but then like my parents and uh, especially my grandfather was really supporting me and helping me to, to do this as a sport, not just as a hobby. Um, I motivate myself to go to competition, but really at the beginning I was not so excited by um, by this, uh, not by the sport part, but more by uh, you know the atmosphere. And I think when I got um, 16, uh, I started to to love really really much uh, the the competition, and uh, and when I was 18. Uh, I decided uh, to do it uh, as a professional. And how did you take that decision and what happened after that? Okay, uh, around 18, um, I was lucky. My grandfather bought me a few horses who were uh, really uh, competitive at this time. Um, and then, yeah, uh, the last, uh, between 16 and 18, uh, not just because of the success, but going to competition, trying um, every time. And uh, I, I think I took this uh, uh, sport spirit and uh, I, um, I, yeah, around 18, I started to be a bit addicted uh, by the competition. So um, I had to find my way to be professional, what to do. Uh, um, the sport was uh, 
uh, already um, really difficult to, uh, to reach the top level. Um, when you want to start uh, as professional and to build a company around the horses, you have not so many things to do. Or you teach or you deal. You buy and you sell horses. So um, I think I was not really good uh, with uh, coaching. So I decided to work for uh, uh, dealing, um, dealing men. And uh, I traveled uh, in many parts of France and many countries. Also continuing to, uh, to learn a lot about uh, uh, my way of riding and uh, really deciding how I wanted to, uh, to build my career. So, but at this time, I have to say between 18 and 22 years old, um, I didn't think about uh, becoming a rider for the, for the top level. Okay. It says uh, on your Wikipedia deal that in 1996, you left home to stay with Michel Eckhart? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I left home. Um, uh, Michel Eckhart's daughter was uh, my girlfriend, so it was easier to, uh, to make a, a meeting with the father and to, uh, to ask him if he could help me for the beginning of my career. Um, at this time, he was based in the uh, south of France, in Aix-en-Provence. So um, I moved there with Marie, and, um, and then um, her father uh, gave me some horses to, to ride, really good horses at the beginning, just some young ones, because he started to breed. But um, later on, I had the opportunity riding for Michel, uh, European Championships young rider and um, to have good success with uh, older horses. So really, um, when I started to be professional, it was the first one, Michel Eka, to give me my chance. Very good. Uh, when, when was your first major win as a young rider or junior or whatever? In junior, I didn't know. I, I won the French Championships in 1996, so I was 16 years old. But it was not the higher level of junior in France. And then um, between 16 and uh, uh, 20, uh, I didn't get, okay, I won some uh, competition in international, uh, in CSI or, or whatever. But um, I didn't win uh, any major title. Uh, the first one I got, it was um, in, uh, I think, uh, 2000 uh, or 2001. It was a uh, European Championships uh, Young Rider uh, by team. And uh, we won the gold there. It was in, uh, in England, in Hartbury. So um, good memory for me. And um, I really started to get at this time the, the team spirit uh, riding for me, for my own country, um, defending the flag with... Uh, uh, with my colleagues, uh, it was really something I enjoyed. Very cool. Uh, do you remember when, when did you realize you had, gone, you had got it? You had got to the top, you were a top rider on the top level with the top goals. <clears throat> when did this actually happen for you? I think around 22. Um, I had a few success, but nothing to say that I, I could reach uh, the, the top level. Um, my way was more to, um, to continue to write for uh, dealers and um, try to get uh, good horses to ride, to uh, improve them and um, to have the chance maybe to ride big competition. But when they were uh, at the level uh, um, to, to go to the, to the top, um, the deal was to sell them and uh, it was more my, my goal to, to work like this uh, because I, I knew that it was so difficult to build uh, stables around the top level, to have uh, sponsors or owners who uh, trust you enough to buy horses for you and to support you, uh, to stay behind you, the, the, your whole career. So yeah, until 22, 24, um, didn't know that I could really um, build my life and my uh, uh, professional life around uh, the, the top sports. So um, then I think it's, it started with my grandfather who uh, bought a, a stallion. Uh, he had seven years old uh, called Kragboom and uh, I became European champion uh, 
in uh, 2009 with Isos. And I think it's really at this time I realized that I could do something. I, uh, I had my chance and uh, if I could continue to work hard and um, to uh, build uh, everything around uh, this career, maybe I, uh, I would have a chance. What was the horse called? Kaikboom, Kaikboom. Kaikboom, yeah. It's yeah. a big bay horse, if I'm not mistaken. That's it? Exactly, it's that. Is in the, yeah. There you go. Yeah, really good. That it was in, um, in La Bowl. Uh, I love this show. And uh, at this time, I think I was uh, already a uh, European champion with, uh, with Kaikboom. And uh, don't remember the uh, the year of the of this Nations Cup, but uh, I was the last one to go, and and we won. I think it was um, Penelope Le Prévost, Michel Robert, and maybe Olivier Guillon. I don't remember who exactly was the first I, one. I, I think that's it. It will show them eventually because they watched the video before. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This horse is a really, really nice story because, um, as I said, my grandfather bought him when um, he was seven. Uh, at this time, I was working for um, a dealing man uh, called Pierre Baldec in um, in east of France, close to Mulhouse. And then we received this horse, and um, this dealer uh, was really close to him. Told me that maybe uh, I had to uh, to propose to my family to invest in this horse because uh, he had really really good qualities and um, difficult, uh, really um, stallion in uh, in his mind, but uh, so careful and so competitive. So my grandfather tried to uh, to make a deal and then he uh, yeah he, he bought this horse. We had so many opportunities to. Uh, to sell him and uh, he, he was really focused to try to help me uh, for the sport and then decide to keep the horse and yeah, then the nice story started. But at the beginning, yeah, the horse was difficult, really sensitive and um, a bit lazy and at the same time uh, uh, stallion in his mind, so we had to uh, to fix it and uh, but with time and the horse has was so careful that uh, when you you could have him with you uh, to have really uh, to build a couple, um, it started to get uh, really nice results. Very good. Well, it's one of the topics that I try to approach. It's about, of course, the horses of your life. Uh, I was studying yourself on FEI rankings, and I'm not even sure if you know that, but you've jumped. You started 110 horses on FEI classes. I didn't know. Which is for me, well, quite a lot. And I'm, I'm sure you have plenty of important horses in your life. Uh, I'll try to keep it to three style of horses that one of them should be, what was the horse of a lifetime until now? Like the most important horse of your career. Uh, second question, who do you have been the money maker? The one that was always in the prize, always speed horse or, you know, and the second, the third one would be the one horse that got away, the one that even got injured or you didn't get a chance to fulfill what you thought it could have done. Yeah. Okay, the first one, the uh, horse of my life, I think the one we have seen in, um, in the video because uh, after this, after the um, wins he gave to me, um, I could really start a career and some owners uh, trust uh, my performances and they um, started to give me some horses to ride and to help me for the sport. So really Crack Boom was um, the one who gave me my chance. And um, second one, the money maker, I think it's Silvana, the grey mare. She's, uh, she was oh, so, so competitive. Yeah, exactly. And um, also, this uh, uh, I love this round. She was giving everything. It was a um, uh, Nations Cup uh, of the WEG in, uh, in Lexington. And um, we had a really bad uh, first day in the speed competition. Normally, um, my mare was so, so fast. But then I did a mistake on, um, on the last fence. She stopped. Normally, she never stopped. But it happened. And I finished, I don't know, so, so far 
like uh, over a uh, hundred in uh, in the rank, and um, and then the day after it was directly the first round of the Nations Cup, and then that is the second uh, second round by night. Um, I had to go in uh, last of the French uh, every time. First one, uh, I had to be clear to be in the top eight teams to to get a chance to 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 ride the the second round. And uh, she was clear. And then this round, uh, I had to be clear to um, to get a chance to get a medal. And uh, yeah, she was she was amazing. Uh, really, you had to ride really really, really badly to make a mistake. Uh, for sure, every time uh, you had a fault, it was uh, a rider uh, fault. But uh, yeah, she was so successful, and uh, yeah, she did few championships. She was winning many Grand Prix. I think Geneva, Bordeaux, uh, few like this, Paris. So yeah, she was a moneymaker. What's the story behind Sivana? Uh, it was um, uh, one CSIO on the way to uh, Rotterdam. Um, I left uh, France. I was based in France at this time, and um, it was a, a dealer, Belgium dealer uh, called uh, uh, Christophe Ameu, who phoned me and said, um, "Oh, it's this Mary. I think you know her, Sylvana. Uh, she's for sale. She's at uh, your sensing uh, stable. Since on your way for Rotterdam, if you want, stop it there." And uh, try her, and uh, and you see what we can do. The mayor was already really successful with uh, Christophe Clearen when she was seven. She won Belgium championships, not for seven years old, but uh, for uh, every um, every different uh, horse. And then um, she was winning um, a big uh, competition at eight uh, years old uh, with Christophe Clearen again in uh, in Lyon, in the five star of Lyon. And then she was also really successful later on with um, with Joss Lansing. So um, I called my um, my sponsor at this time. It was uh, Ziara de Us. She was. Uh, it's why she had the color of uh, Us uh, later on. And um, I told him that we had this uh, proposal, and um, what if he wanted that uh, I go to try her or not? And he said, Yeah, okay, go to try. And honestly, I jumped maybe one meter twenty maximum. You could feel the quality uh, from the first jump, already f- unbelievable. So yeah, the trial was uh, fantastic. Then uh, after that, uh, I continue my uh, my way to to Rotterdam, and then my uh, my sponsor called me uh, on um, on the evening, just before the first day of competition, and said, "Okay, you have a new horse. You can bring her uh, on the way back in your truck and." Come with her in the, in the stables. So yeah, that was the beginning. And um, from the first show uh, I rode her, she was yeah so successful. But as I told you, it was difficult to make a, a mistake with this uh, with this horse. Fantastic. And which horse got away? Um, I was riding for the same sponsor, and um, we bought. Uh, a horse called um, Bilun Darsui. It was a um, full brother of Vigo Darsui. And uh, then uh, he, had, um, he had a colleague and um, we, had, uh, yeah, we had to let him go uh, because he, it was yeah, so, so strong. The horse was just uh, eight and um, really promising scope and um, a little bit difficult in the way to manage because uh, uh, he was so subtle. You had to canalize him uh, every time. But yeah, this one I think had uh, had everything to to become a champion. Very good. Give me an important win of your career. Uh, with Rever and the French team. Nah, I don't hear you. No, I don't.
No, 